Hey guys, I am so excited to announce that the movie that you've been waiting for, the documentary Dr. Patient, is now available for rent or purchase at drpatientmovie.com. Check out the trailer here. When I really knew something was wrong was when I started having trouble walking up the stairs. I was supposed to be grateful and happy and healing and well and thriving, but I did not feel that way. I was so sick. Like always, I wanted to find an answer and I had to figure it out, and I had to figure it out to save my own life. So I dove in. Jill is the leading voice in biotoxin illness and chronic conditions that are driven by toxicity. Oh my gosh, you're dealing with mold? You have to work with Dr. Jill Carnahan. Dr. Jill was the first person that actually began to shed some light on the problem. What I do is listen to the patient and we together talk about what else is possible. I don't know why I'm crying. <laughs> she saved my life. The deepest lessons and most profound insights come in the suffering, come in the dark moments. Self-compassion is the healing transition that, that shifts something inside of us. It's actually the thing that we need most in order to heal. Dr. Patient. Available now at drpatientmovie.com. Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in functional and integrative medicine. I'm Dr. Jill, your host, and each episode we delve deep into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join us as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, and innovators who are at the forefront of medical research and practice, empowering you with knowledge and inspiration on your journey to optimal health. Today, I have special guest, Dr. Peter Bongiorno. Is that how I say your name? Bongiorno. Oh, sure. No, <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Very Italian. <laughs> yes, I love it. It's fun just to say it, Dr. Bongiorno. <laughs> um, his passion is to bring effective holistic healing to the practice of mental health. He has the thriving practices in both New York City and Long Island established in 2004. Prior to earning his naturopathic doctorate at Bastyr University, he researched as a pre-doctoral fellow at the National Institutes of Mental Health and Yale University's Department of Pharmacology. He authored the first textbook on integrative medicine for depression in 2008. And since then, he's authored numerous papers, textbook chapters, and books on the topic of integrative medicine and teaches the nat naturopathic and functional medicine community on how to effectively heal mood usually natural medicines. I am so excited. And right beside me here, I've got your new book. Oh, I'll hold it up. Thank so you. That, yeah, that's, that's and, an honor. <laughs> yes, at the start, we want to be sure and grab this. And before we jump into your story, I just want to say like the topic is so timely. I am seen as I'm sure you, I think the statistic was in 2022, maybe a 400 increase um, diagnosis and treatment like prescriptions for SSRIs and medications for depression. Um, and we're going to dive into that today. So if you're here listening and you have struggled or you have a loved one who's struggling, there are answers for you. And we've got the expert on board. Before we jump into the answers, tell us a little bit about your journey into medicine and especially into the world of mental health. Sure. Well, thank you for that kind, kind introduction. And thank you for the work you're doing and to your listeners for spending your valuable time with us. Um, yeah. So for me, it started, um, I uh, had graduated college. I had a degree in biology and uh, also a double major. I had a degree in English literature, which is a, it's kind of the hallmark of somebody who doesn't know what they want to do with their life, right? And I thought I wanted to go to medical school, uh, but having experience uh, with medicine and, you know, I did volunteering at hospitals and worked at doctor's offices and, um, and, um, and at the time, um, I was a little, uh, I wasn't sure it's what I wanted to do. It didn't feel right. I didn't know what felt right. Um, the only thing I really loved um, besides school was playing music. So I did uh, what my uh, immigrant uh, Italian parents wanted me to do, which was join a rock band instead of go to medical school. So uh, so I did that for a little while. That's and amazing because normally the parents are like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that was that was a joke. They did not yeah. want me. I, they did not want me to do that. They were not happy. I love so, it. Dad, I apologize. Yeah, and um, so um, you know, and I I had ended up doing research uh for a while. I was down to the National Institutes of Health, and a girlfriend of mine um had uh 
uh, multiple sclerosis. Uh, she had, uh, you know, we were both, I think, in our early 20s, about 23. Wow. And she was getting very sick and she had the chronic progressive type. And um, and she uh, found out about basically a naturopathic doctor, which, you know, I was at the NIH trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I was thinking, well, maybe I'll get an MD, PhD or do lab work. And she went to this person who, you know, I thought was probably a quack, right, who did naturopathic medicine. And, um, and you know, I learned a lot. Um, I basically learned that diet has a lot to do with MS. And there was a, a I remember uh, the fellow told me, you know, when you get a chance, you're at NIH, go look up this study. It's by this guy named Swank. It's about a 40-year 40, 40 study from the 40s to the early 80s, where he took multiple sclerosis patients and he divided them into two groups. One group got standard of care and the other group got a very low saturated, high polyunsaturated diet and, and a multiple vitamin, basically. And the uh, the group that got the low saturated, high polyunsaturated, the healthy fats diet, right, uh, did really well. You know, they went on to have much lower exacerbation rates than the group that just had the standard of care. And, you know, and I remember looking at this and I was at the NIH and thinking to myself, well, you know, we've been to a couple of neurologists, no one talked about this, Yes. you know, and this was in the early nineties when I, I know, you know, functional medicine was just being birthed. Right? right. So, so nobody was talking about it. And, um, so that was my aha moment, you know, where I thought, okay, you know, this is interesting to me. This makes us, this makes sense and maybe could even make a difference. So I decided to go to naturopathic school and uh, that's how I got started in it. And then when I, um, I graduated in 2003 and got to New York. Um, what I noticed is that most of my patients were on some kind of benzodiazepine or anti-anxiety medication or antidepressant or something, you know, for their mood because their mood was just intolerable to them and they got drugged for it. And, and there wasn't really a lot of literature out there about integrative medicine for depression. The little bit that was out there said, oh, you can't mix natural medicines and drugs. You just don't do that. It's dangerous. And not much else. So that's why I started kind of culling that information. And a, a mentor of mine back at NIH, he did a book on a textbook on depression and had me write the complementary and alternative medicine section, which wow. is uh, what it was called at the time. And um, and from there, I said, well, you know, I have all this information about what's available. I'm going to keep working on this. And that's and I got really excited about it. And I saw people getting better as I learned more about it. And um, and that's and it. Yeah. So it kind of just took off from there. You know, it's been 21 years now. <laughs> wow. And we are very close parallel journey. I graduated in 2003 from medical school as well. And one of the things is I hear you talk that's so interesting. And I saw this as well is. I love maybe your comments on this because we see it in the world of whether it's nutritional research or integrative um, uh, modalities. Mm -hmm. I think one reason maybe we don't see it is it's not as well funded by pharmaceuticals because there's usually not a, a big dro a blockbuster drug. It's a nutrient that's free or, or inexpensive or generic, right? But any thoughts as to why you in naturopathic medicine, me in uh, allopathic medicine, we didn't, we had to go digging. The research is out there and it's now coming out. But why do you think it is that that we don't get exposed to because there is data on some of this stuff and more and more and more coming out but in our both of our trainings i think there was less of it than was actually out there and it's it's just i want i right. want the people there listening to know why they're maybe not hearing about things other than drugs well you know i think the perfect example is there was a study a couple of years ago um out of the university of copenhagen and and they studied exercise and joggers people who did mild jogging, moderate, or a lot of jogging, kind of excessive. And what they found was that people who did mild to moderate jogging, which was not much, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, and I apologize, I don't have the numbers uh, in my head anymore, but it might have been like 30, 40 minutes, two, three times a day, a very slow to you know mid pace. And they found the men lived about 6.2 years longer, and the women lived 5.3 years longer. Wow. People who jog excessively actually did not live as long. Yes. And now think about that. If there was a drug that could extend your life six, 5.3 to 6.2 years and not only not have side effects, but have so many benefits in your health, cardiovascular health, uh, weight, how you look, your skin, like all of these things, like it would be the biggest blockbuster drug. It would be all over the place. I know I would buy it, right? Yeah. And it would 
it would make billions and billions of dollars. And yet we do have something yes. <laughs> called yes. and exercise, which has been proven to do that. And yet it wasn't, I didn't see it on the news, you know, yeah. I, I, you know, so it's amazing to me. So the question is, I know you asked the question, why, you know, and I think the answer is, you know, uh, I was in, uh, I was at a conference a few weeks ago and I was speaking to a woman who was from India and, and she told me that she was very impressed about how the United States you know, in 200 years became such a superpower. Um, and and they, we were able to do so many things and grow this country from such a young country to such a strong country and become a leader in the world in such a short period of time. But, and then she also said, which I never thought about it, she said, um, but unfortunately the that push towards capitalism really just begets the situation where you're gonna really talk about the things that have to do with making money, right? Yes. So, and even you hit though the nail on the head, right? Like that's yeah. uh, sadly, ultimately, I mean, even back in med school, I remember like we learned the big pharmaceutical drugs, but so many of the other things like diet, lifestyle, exercise, which we'll go into today. It's like the standard line from the professor was, well, your patients probably won't want to do this, but, and it might be an afterthought <laughs> because we assume we go in there, assuming that patients won't want to exercise, won't want to eat right. Like how ridiculous is that? So many doctors have this jaded mentality around, oh, patients won't want to change their diet. Well, well why not ask? Why not delve into it? Right. Right. Or, or the, some of the literature I remember reading about also said, well, but compliance will be low, right? Yes. That's thing you're saying like and you say well wait a second but maybe that's what we need to work on you know right. maybe we need to kind of get them inspired about yeah. it or explain how it works you know the you know i remember in naturopathic school we learned the word doctor uh, means teacher right we gotta if we don't teach and talk about it why would you why would anyone be interested because they don't believe it works and yes yeah Yes. So let's start with some of that. I loved your book. I thought it was a great outline. And interestingly, a local um, a church that I attend asked me to talk about mental health. And I actually happened to get your book right around the time. And it was such a great like piece to look mm -hmm. at for the, all the, the research and stuff that you put together. So I want to encourage people to grab a copy because everything's in here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, thank holistic you. Solutions. And, and that is, I just want to let people know if they're interested, that is a, um, a textbook. Yeah. Um, so it's written at a slightly higher level. It's friendly enough to yeah. read um, but it was designed for professionals. I do have two books for the public as well. Um, oh, this, I didn't even know that. This is great. Yeah, uh, I, we have a lot well, of physician and practitioner listeners. So if you're, but I agree. I mean, of course I'm a practitioner, so it was easy and wonderful for me, but I think it's well-written for any person. Um, who, so I think it would be really, so let's talk, uh, uh, let's talk about sleep. I kind of want to go through some of the things, exercise, sleep, lifestyle, but I feel like if, if people ask me about my superpower or things that like I, I non-negotiable for me, my mm -hmm. life has always been grounded in really good sleep. I remember back to the years of like uh, mid grade school slumber parties where the girls would get together and they'd stay up all night. Mm -hmm. I would literally every time get home and get sick always, because for me, my constitution, mm -hmm. I needed seven, eight hours of sleep and I just did not do well. And finally my mom was like, you can't go anymore. <laughs> And I, and I kind of agreed, like I just didn't do well, but since then I'm in my forties now. And literally I will say no to invitations or do things built around. I'll travel my travel schedule, my flight schedule around the fact I want to get good sleep because I know mm -hmm. that that is when I get good sleep, I can do almost anything. Let's talk about that in relation to anxiety, depression, and why I feel like we need to start with quality sleep. Absolutely. Um, you know, and it's interesting because if you read all my books, the uh, the book you have and the books for the public too, the first chapter is one the name real quick. So people are like, what's the name oh, of the yeah. book for the public? That way they can uh, grab that. If you don't mind, I'll show them. Oh, um, please do. This yeah. one's called How Come They're Happy and I'm Not. Perfect. Perfect. And this is the book uh, for depression and okay. in low mood. And then uh, this one is Put Anxiety Behind You, which Perfect. is a uh, a book for anxiety. Yeah. We'll so put all the links, if you're listening, wherever you're listening to all of those. <laughs> so, and, um, you know, and one of the, the first chapter I always write, and if you notice in the book you have, when I talk about treatment plans, uh, I put sleep on the top because sleep has got to be number one. If we don't work on sleep, you know, it's interesting about three, four years ago, uh, one or one of the psychiatry journals uh, came out with a, a couple of papers talking about how important sleep was. And I remember thinking, wow, they're talking about it like this is new information. Right. <laughs> <You know>? like, <laughs> 
It's like, of course it's important. It's like, I know when I don't sleep, my mood goes down, my my blood sugar's all over the place, my blood pressure goes up. Um, I just don't feel good. You know, I need good sleep. I love napping when I could take a nap. Um, doesn't happen every day, but um, yeah, but sleep is when our bodies detox. It's when they fix things, the mitochondria, right, which are the energy packs in our body, get rebuilt and recycled. And um, our bodies do so much good. The digestive tract cleans out. Um, so we need to sleep. Yeah. Why is it? So uh, for me, again, my history is I need good sleep. Um, if I don't get good sleep, I'm an emotional wreck. Mm. So can you talk about that? And I don't know, this is women, men, both, or if you've seen any correlation, but why is it that emotional regulation, it's almost like the ability to control and like live right. in life and not fall apart at the slightest, like spilt milk analogy. Sure. <laughs> and and mm. when we don't sleep, we have this very difficult emotional regulation. Can you talk a little bit about why that might be and why people might suffer more from overwhelm, anxiety, depression when they aren't sleeping? Sure. Well, I think there's a few reasons. If I had to pick like a, a simple way to think about it, you know, an animal that doesn't go to sleep is either getting chased <laughs> or it, it's got to find food and it's going to die, right? So uh, I think the primitive brain back here has this mechanism of, oh, I didn't sleep. It must be bad times. Let me stay really stressed out, you know? So our bodies are going to be on high alert, are going to be stressed. Um, our mood's going to change because we're not interested in enjoying life. We're interested in protecting ourselves. And I think that is just a mechanism we all have that uh, happens when we don't sleep. So even one or two nights can be enough to make us feel pretty crummy. And of course, if you're already predisposed to anxiety or depression or have issues with bipolar and, and changes in mood, um, then it's going to exacerbate it even more. So some people can handle it better than others. I don't think anyone feels great. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but the poor sleep definitely, um, you know, it changes our brain and puts us in that mode. And so we're not going to feel good until we get sleep. And then we get sleep and we feel like ourselves again. We're like, ah, I should have gotten sleep. <laughs> hey everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science and Faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you wanna get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com there you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. Yes, yeah, it changes everything. Like it's a whole different view yeah. from me, like the, the view of the world. So let's move to exercise. You touched on that because there have been lots and lots of studies. I think some of the most powerful studies around activity, movement, exercise. And I love that you mentioned the Copenhagen study because it wasn't like what I found is the super high intensity can actually be not great. So talk right. about types of exercise, how much exercise, yeah. what the studies research kind of support for mood. Absolutely. Well, had, there's no question, the benefits of exercise, head-to-head -head studies with the major leading drugs for depression show that exercise does work just as well and have less side effects. It takes a little longer to work sometimes, but when you stop both either exercise or the medication, the exercise uh, benefits actually last longer. So there's no question, you know, when you think about it, what does exercise do? It raises serotonin, raises dopamine, raises norepinephrine, the things that the drugs do, but doesn't naturally, you know? So, um, so there's so many reasons why it's worth trying exercise. Now, of course, you know, if, for your listeners listening out there, and I've worked with many patients who are depressed, and they're thinking, I know they're thinking this, I can hear them saying, well, if I wasn't depressed, I would go exercise. Correct. You know? I was just thinking that. Yes. How do we yeah. get so, motivated? So that, <laughs> right. Absolutely. And and some people who have very low adrenal function and, and they just don't have the energy, maybe their iron is low, their vitamin D is low, their adrenals aren't working. If they go out and exercise, they could actually feel worse because they're going to burn energy they don't have. So, so for some people, getting out and moving um, can be really helpful. For other people, they may have to figure out whether, you know, just a gentle walk is, is the best. 
Um, so you have to really listen to your body and work with a practitioner who can help you figure out, well, maybe exercise, you're not ready for that. Maybe we'll just start with a walk, a little Tai Chi, and then move on to you know more strenuous work once you're in a stronger place. And, and that's where doing you know the right testing can help looking at your adrenal function, looking at your the levels of your vitamins, your iron levels, B12, you know, all of those things that could play a role in why maybe your energy is so low. That makes so much sense because I treat a lot of women and a lot of women over 40 who are either perimenopausally or menopause. And mm -hmm. I really feel like many of them do, including myself at that age, I had, you have to shift from a Mary, maybe you're doing high intensity or some really intense protocol to maybe more of a walking, hiking, moving um, and that leads us to in nature, there's a lot of your um, uh, tips that talk about like actually getting outside, touching your feet, mm -hmm. drinking in nature. Mm -hmm. What effect does that have on mood and why is that important? Yeah, you know, I love thinking about that. Did you know uh, Dr. Uh, Stephen Sinatra, yes. the cardiologist? He was such a proponent of, uh, of grounding. And I remember learning a lot of that from him. And, um, you know, it's just our bodies are made to be out in nature. We are animals. Animals do really well in nature. I know, you know, I have a dog, a beautiful dog, and, you know, and he sits around during the day and he's fine and his mood is okay and he sleeps a lot. He goes, and then as soon as I says, hey, Elon, want to go take a walk? He like, he gets so excited, you know, because that's where his body wants to be outside sniffing things and, yeah. and, and being out in the sun. And, and we're the same, you know, we want that. That helps our serotonin go up. It helps our dopamine go up, our norepinephrine. Like, and those are the things that help our mood. So we are, even though we spend most of our time indoors, most of us, we really are made to be outside and go outside. And, and nature provides so many signals to keep our bodies healthy. There are things that come from the trees. They're called phytonicids, and we breathe them in. And they actually get into our bloodstream and they lower inflammation. They lower cortisol levels when they're too high, or they'll raise cortisol a little bit when they're too low. Like it's just nature's so balancing for us, and and we're just made to be in nature. <laughs> so. Wow, it sounds like trees as adaptogens, right? <laughs> like how beautiful. Remember, one of my uh, teachers, uh, Dr. Mitchell at, at Bastier, he was one of the founders of uh, Bastier, uh, the naturopathic school in Seattle, and he would tell us, you know, just go, just go outside, sit next to a tree look at the tree, talk to it, breathe next to it, listen to it, breathe, you know, he would, uh, you know, and the idea was we just, we just need to be part of nature. And, um, and the more we are part of nature, the more our bodies will regulate themselves. Yes, I love this. And especially as we started, what we've seen is post pandemic, um, and especially I think the younger generations who have been through this and through school mm -hmm. and isolated and all of these things, there's definitely an uptick in depression. And there's also an uptick in inflammation related to um, old viruses, reactivation, yeah. mold exposure. That's one thing during the pandemic, all of a sudden everybody's in their houses. And if their houses happen to have toxic chemicals or off guessing, maybe let's shift just a little bit to that as far as how would like toxic chemicals or um, the foods that we're eating, if we're not, um, I would say clean air, clean water, mm -hmm. clean food, if those things aren't in place, how could that affect our mood and what could we do about it? Yeah, so um, so toxic chemicals. For example, uh, you know, one of the one of the examples is things like fluoride, right? We know that fluoride will come into our body and replace minerals that we need, things like iodine, and kind of take its place, and and then not allow like organ systems, like the thyroid, for example, to do its job. Um, you know, mercury, uh, which can come from uh, different areas of the environment, can also do the same thing, displace magnesium. And when there isn't enough magnesium around, it can actually take hold even better in our bodies. It can affect our heart. It can affect our nervous system. Um, so and then there's phthalates, you know, which are uh, hormonal. Uh, they can affect the hormones in our body, especially things like estrogen levels and, and change how estrogens work in our body. So all of these these uh, chemicals act similar to things in our body, but not in a good way. They kind of block what our natural body uh, molecules should be doing. And that's why they're toxic to us. And so they all kind of do it in a different way, but the, but the load of toxins um, is just becoming greater and greater and greater. In fact, um, I'm especially concerned about the uh, data on pollution, you know, pollution um, uh, kills by itself about 8.3 million people globally in a year on its own. 
So, you know, when we think about um, the numbers for COVID, and of course that was a concern and an awful time, and but those numbers pale in comparison to what pollution is doing every year to us. So yeah. It is a big deal. And I always say like the air, which is why clean air matters, is is the most Walter Crinian, who's probably yeah. someone you've yeah, learned. Yeah, he was a well, teacher. Yeah. Right? I mean, he's just amazing. And he would always say 80% of our environmental toxic load is from the air that we breathe. And that yeah. always surprised me, but it kind of doesn't because all these articles on nanoparticulate from exhaust and combustion. Right petroleum products is really, really affecting our brains. And it's because it's so small. We inhale, it goes directly into our bloodstream through that right. alkali right. and no. boom, our tissues. No. Right? Yeah. 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 Our bodies are made. Maybe in a million or two million years, our body will get better adapted to not block them out, but yeah, uh, not right now. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so, um, so let's shift to, um, I want to talk briefly because you mentioned hormones, because I know um, in my mind, I think about adrenals, thyroid, male and female hormones, and we know all of these has a pretty profound effect on the mood. How would you look at, um, say, the average you know, 30-year-old woman or 50-year-old woman? Um, what kinds of lab tests would you want to be sure they ask their doctor about before they just assume they need an SSRI um, to, to rule out any other just organic or hormonal causes of depression, anxiety? Yeah. You know, I remember... Um... When I was in school, so this was about 25 years ago, I was a, a student following other doctors around. And I remember when the first patients I saw with depression, it was a woman who came in. And and I remember my my uh, clinical advisor was Dr. Wallace, a great doc. He's still a best year, a really excellent person. And um, and I remember he found that the iron levels of this woman were low. and And she had been on an SRI for at least two years. And, uh, and it was very, she couldn't get off it, but she was having a lot of side effects. And, and basically he tested her iron, gave her iron, and she came in about a month and a half later and he checked in on her and she said, and, you know, a number of things, how good she's feeling. And she says, oh, and by the way, I stopped that medication. And I'm not telling people they should stop right, it. Right, right. But she did it on her own. Uh -huh. But, but uh, yeah, so that wasn't a great idea. But, but the fact is, is that once she had the proper iron levels, her body could carry oxygen to her brain, right? Because iron is so important in how your body carries oxygen. And um, so for her, um, it wasn't a hormonal issue. It was it was just, you know, she needed some basics. Um, but then, you know, the question you asked is about, a, a, a you know, a typical 30-year-old or a 50-year-old woman um, who's maybe depressed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there. what I've learned is there is no typical 30 or 50-year-old woman. We all have these factors that are involved in what can affect our mood. It could be uh, the mitochondria, it could be our digestive tract, it could be inflammation. Like I said before, it could be all those low nutrients. So the best we can do is check. And I have in my book, I have a list of, of a, like a first set of labs that you can you know rip the page out, bring it to your doctor and say, hey doc, you know, we really appreciate looking at these and hopefully they'll be amenable to do that. Um, because there is no one or two or three or four things to look at. There's probably about 30 or 40 things to look at, you know, and you mentioned all the environmental stuff too. So there's the stuff going on inside the body. There's the stuff going on outside the body. There's the stressors that are going on. There's maybe, uh, you know, sleep habits could be an issue or exercise habits, one direction or another. So there are just a lot of things to look at. And what I've learned over the years is that I am not smart enough to figure out what's really causing mood issues in a person. But what I do know is that I, if I look at all these factors and keep track of them and start making changes in a way that a, a person uh, can do in their life and their schedule and make it really work for them, then the body figures it out. You know, the body is, is has the wisdom and it can figure it out. And we're just supporting it with what we know, you know? Yeah, I don't know about you, but I remember the beginning early years of integrative medicine and I would do a protocol and kind of check the thyroid or check the hormones and try to fix what I could. And the patient mm -hmm. would come back 30 days later. I'm like, doc, I'm better. This is, I'm like, really? You know, like it really <laughs> works, right? But when I wonder you why. <laughs> You're right. You, you, you don't know body knows. Yeah, it's almost amazing to see the results because it, this stuff really works. And uh, I, now, of course, I expect it to work. But in the very beginning, I'm like, really, it works? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's, and I have to say, I mean, uh, you know, no, just getting to know you and reading your book, my guess is, you know, they say a lot of it has to do with the doctor patient relationship. And I would imagine like you just exude such amazing energy. And that's healing too, you know, and um, so for people listening out there, 
you want to pick a practitioner who you feel you harmonize with and you feel like you're getting good energy from uh, and that they care, you know, so and I know you do. And I'm sure that has a lot to do with the healing uh, powers there. Oh, thank you. That's the most kind thing anyone's ever said on public on the on the podcast, because I really do hope that, um, and I'm sure your patients feel it as well, but when we meet the patient there with just this unconditional loving container that's just like, tell me about your story, and I want to hear who you are, and they really feel seen and heard, I, I know that's the secret weapon because that's the foundation. Because when you have that trust, then all of a sudden you build this relationship of like, I have this advice, and it's back and forth, as you know. It's not like I tell patients, you have to do this. It's let's talk about what will work into your lifestyle. How does this work? Mm -hmm. But at the foundation is that trust and that true, like, I really love my patients. And right. I know, I, I'm sure you exude the same thing. I genuinely love what I do. I love the people that get in front of me. And I know that's the that's a huge secret <laughs> to healing. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's such an honor, it's such an honor to be with patients. I, I know they, you know, my first visit's an hour and a half. And, and, all, and I've heard so many times the patient will say by the end, like, you know, nobody knows this much about me you know so and that's such an honor it's just you know what what could be more of an honor than to have somebody really tell you about their life and and be vulnerable yes. to you and this, it, you know so they can get the help and and the healing that they're looking for and um so yeah, it's, so it's, it's a, a sacred space like, isn't it? oh my gosh it's you know even when i'm tired or i don't feel so great in the morning you know by the end of the day i'm in, i'm excited and i'm enthused you know because you just meet all these wonderful people and um and you get to share that experience with them sorry and then when they come back well you're like this is amazing <laughs> so um so let's talk just briefly i want to talk about um the some of the core nutrients you mentioned like iron magnesium to make sure that mm -hmm. patients can get those in their diet and maybe some diet tips but before i do i just want to touch on screens screen time mobile mm -hmm. phones because i feel like this is one of those things that's not really talked as much about although like dr anna lemke's come out a lot about it and and the addictive mm -hmm. i mean our devices are created to be addictive machines right and so what happens is we get these dopamine loops and we get stuck to the phone instead of human interaction and i guess along with that social connection is so critical to mood let's talk about that like how do we um disconnect from devices and connect socially for our improvement in anxiety and depression? Yeah, no question. That's such a, a big topic and even bigger after COVID. And um, and I see, especially in, you know, uh, my younger patients, my teenagers and, and early 20s patients, uh, it, it's such a factor. Uh, and like you said, you know, we, we're exposed to this bright light and these quick moving things and, it, you know, it changes our dopamine levels. And then when we don't have it, you know, our bodies, like, you know, when you go look at a tree, it's not doing that. And, right. and so it's not going to stimulate that dopamine. So we feel bored and, and we don't get the excitement in real life that we get from these screens. And, and that will predispose us to depression and anxiety and things because we're, we, you know, we're waiting for, oh, why is this thing moving? You know, uh, you know, well, it's because it's real. It's not fake. You know, it's, it doesn't have this bright screaming light at us. So, um, so it's so important for us to realize, look, we can't get rid of technology, right? It's here. And I always have a joke. I'm like, oh, those computers, um, it's a fad. They're not going to last, but you know, it's a joke because uh -huh. they're lasting. And, um, you know, so we have to kind of see our, ourselves, you know, how much time do we really spend on the computer? How do we feel? You know, um, if you don't feel good, is that possible that that's a factor that maybe if if I had to pick a place, I would say most importantly is probably in the evening before bed, like maybe pick a half hour before bed, an hour if you can, and just shut the screens. You know, I have patients put on an orange light bulb, you know, uh, and maybe read like a, an actual book yeah. by by an orange light bulb and and let your melatonin come in, you know, so you can sleep getting, you know, now we're going full circle, right? Right back to sleep. Because if, um, it, you know, because they will stop us from doing that. And then we wonder why we can't get into those deeper stages of sleep. You know, sometimes the body is exhausted, and it will go down. But we don't get into a deep sleep, because we're still kind of revved. Yes. So we need that time. So getting rid of the screens before bed would be ideal. And then uh, I know I try to you know, I still buy a newspaper, I try to read a paper from time to, you know, uh, I try not to do everything on the computer, so much has to be done. But um, so I, that, agree. That I love the real books. I was like, this is such a treat to like disconnect. And 
my little tip has been I really shut off all notifications during the day. And uh, when I'm really trying to do a block of productive time, I'll actually put the phone in a different room because uh. the studies show that even having it at your desk, even if you don't look at it, is distracting for our brains. That's so insane. it's really good. Well, you're <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's hard, but it, I think sometimes we have to take these extreme measures. Um, yeah, makes so, a lot of sense. Yeah, uh, so nutrients and food. Where would you start mm -hmm. with like the uh, optimal diet for depression? What are some of the core things yeah. there? Well, the first step is water. Yeah, that's probably the first nutrient. Uh, we many of us can be very dehydrated. Um, it's been shown that. Uh, water increases longevity, water increases things like serotonin in your brain because uh, you can't get tryptophan into your brain to make the serotonin if you're not hydrated. So um, so even before food, water. Um, and if I had to pick a second for mood, and this, these are of course very general recommendations, um, but um, you know, making sure people are getting enough protein. You know, proteins break down into amino acids. Amino acids how you make, help you make the neurotransmitters. Um, and, and oftentimes we don't get enough protein. So, and protein is really good for balancing blood sugar, which is also going to be important for triggering the stress system and anxiety and depression as well. So, um, so eating, you know, a regular meals. And I know some people do well with more of an intermittent fasting, but I've also seen many of my patients who have mood issues, they actually do need to eat more regularly. So they kind of almost have to do the opposite um, so if some people intermittent fasting works for them and they stay healthy, then, you know, that's great. But for other people, especially if you have mood issues and you get affected by drops in blood sugar, then, then it's probably better to eat, you know, more frequent meals, protein, healthy fat, a little bit of healthy carb at each meal. And, um, and that could be a testament too to maybe the cortisol levels because cortisol helps your liver uh, put sugar into your blood so your brain feels happy. So sometimes people who don't eat and their blood sugar drops, it's really because that cortisol system isn't working for them or their liver and or their liver. So, you know, it's a little different for everybody, but I, I like the idea of, um, you know, good quality food throughout the day. And, um, and if I had to pick one diet, not knowing a person or their sensitivities or you know, or even their preferences, I would probably start with a, a Mediterranean style diet. It's, um, it seems to be the healthiest. It seems to be the one most um, associated with longevity. Um, and not just because it's, you know, part of my Sicilian background, but because the, the data is really there, <laughs> there, you know, so, uh, so, uh, and if uh, there's so many great studies, uh, starting from studies out of Spain in the early 2000s about the Mediterranean diet and how it can help prevent and treat uh, mood disorders. So. Yeah, I actually love that you say that because I couldn't agree more. There's so many camps of carnivore, paleo, ve vegan, and everything in between, right? And they do have a place. I still use all Absolutely. of them. Absolutely, me all too. Them. But I actually love that because I feel the same, like plants still are core. And we know from like Dan Buettner's research on the blue zones, which is those centigenarians that live over a hundred, they all have legumes and kind of local cuisine. And also um, you mentioned Mediterranean has a lot of healthy oils, which is what our brain's made of. So the fatty acids and the oils. Um, so really love that overview of diet. One little tip that I've done for probably 20 years, because I had Crohn's mm -hmm. and so I always had some malabsorption issues is free amino acids. I've actually taken them as a supplement because it's like the building blocks of protein. I still do protein, but yep. I actually think in those people who maybe have a little bit more trouble getting that, that sometimes you can Absolutely. supplement like that. Because what we learned is those are all precursors of norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, anandamides, as you well know. So you really do need those. So the last few minutes, let's talk a little bit about supplements because um, you and I both use a lot of supplements. I feel like I can do the same thing um, as a drug often with the right balance and blend of supplements. And where would you start? Um, maybe give us some examples of some key things that you might try for anxiety and then maybe for depression. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And again, another bold statement, you could do the same things as you can with a drug. I know the drug companies probably don't want to hear that. But um, but you're right. It's uh, supplements when used properly uh, can be very powerful. Um, and, you know, and what I usually like to tell people, uh, even before we get started with the supplements, is say supplements are part of a bigger picture of working with sleep, exercise, the right foods, working on your stress, working on relaxation, getting out into nature, detoxing when necessary, and then the right supplements can really support all those phases for you. So, um, yeah, I mean, and there are so many stuff out there and that's one of the reasons I like to run testing, you know, so I'm not guessing 
what a person needs or doesn't need. But that, so the testing can really help me make some decisions and supplements, or sometimes it's just from, you know, the things that were handed down to me from other naturopathic doctors from years ago, things that they just knew worked and I see work too. So um, if I had to pick a few, um, I mean, I'm thinking for depression, um, there are some wonderful supplements like curcumin has been shown head to head with a number of medications to work just as well with less side effects. Uh, SAMe, uh, which is an acronym for S adenosyl methionine, um, has also been shown to have very good efficacy. I think one thing which is dropping off, um, which really shouldn't, is St. John's wort. St. John's wort is an amazing herb. Uh, it's a it's a beautiful. Oh, speaking of uh, shutting, uh, <laughs> so um, that was my mother. So uh -huh. she heard. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, St. John's Wort. It's a, it's an antiviral. It's good for anxiety. It's good for depression. It's it's a it's a good way to move your circulatory system. I mean, it has so many properties. And I think, um, you know, in the uh, more conventional world, they think of St. John's Wort as another SSRI. And I, you know, my opinion, based on the research, it has very little of that effect, but it does so many other things in the body. Um, the only side, the only thing I would be concerned about is that it does change the processing of other medications in your body. So you really want to be careful if you're taking medications to check on that and make sure that, you know, it's not going to inhibit or make more effective um, the ability of other drugs to work. So, um, so those are some of my favorites. I love, um, I use a fair amount of uh, nutritional lithium. Um, I think that has a good effect. It's, it's not a strong effect, but I think it, um, along with a few other ones like L-theanine, which is very calming to the nervous system, it can work really well. I use a fair amount of CBD. Um, I really think CBD is excellent and works on, again, a, n a number of mechanisms throughout the body, not just for serotonin, but for pain and inflammation and for sleep and um, mitochondrial function. So it hits a whole lot of boxes that so many of us with mood issues have, you know, uh, going on. So um, so th those are just some of them. I mean, there's, uh, yeah, if there's any others you want to talk about, I'd um, be happy to talk about them. <laughs> no, that's a fantastic. Um, and I, I actually like those preferred over even 5-HTP and, and uh, like tryptophan, which have been around a long time as serotonin. Yeah. But um, yeah, really yeah, which uh, can be really helpful too. I definitely see them work as well with the you know with the right patients. So. Yeah, excellent. Um, wow, this has been a tremendous overview. And like I said, if you're listening, you'll be sure. And wherever you're listening to this, I will have links to all of Dr. Bungiorno's books and um and things. And if you're a practitioner, be sure and get this one. <laughs> I've got my copy all marked up, and it's just a oh, thank you. Yeah, That's an awesome. absolutely. Thank you. In our last just minute or two, I'd love for you to just speak directly to that person out there that is um, uh, listening and they have struggled with depression or anxiety for as long as they can remember. And maybe they feel a bit hopeless. Obviously, we've given them lots of practical tips, maybe at just a heart level. What would you end with for that person who's been struggling? Yeah, that's thank you. Um, yeah, what I would say is that it's, um, you know, there are practitioners out there who, who really, I think, understand the body in a more global way. And if you're working, let's say, with a psychiatrist and, and maybe medication hasn't quite worked for you, don't don't give up hope and certainly don't just stop medications because sometimes that could be much, much worse. So you want to check in with your psychiatrist. But in the meantime, also look for a good functional medicine doctor, a good naturopathic doctor, um, because there are other factors involved that maybe haven't been looked at yet. And when you find the person who can kind of help you organize all those factors, then the body can really stop healing itself. So don't give up on that because the body absolutely can heal itself. I've just seen amazing things over the last 21 years. Um, there, there aren't quick fixes. So if you're not feeling well, you know, it's don't expect to go in and in a week, you're just going to feel better because they're going to give you some herb or something. Uh, it's usually not that quick, but with with um, with consistency and really understanding your body, really profound shifts can happen. So don't don't give up. Look for that practitioner who you feel comfortable with, and that'll be the right person for you. Uh, love it. And where can people find you? Do you have a website or page that people can go and get more? Oh, sure. Yeah, you can go to uh, my website is drpeterbongiorno.com. It's D R then P-E-T-E-R, and then my last name, B-O-N-G-I-O-R-N-O.com. 
And I'm also on uh, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter too. <laughs> so, Perfect. yeah, we will link link you up to there. Um, thank you again, Dr. Bongiorno, and thank you all for joining us today for this episode of Resiliency Radio. It has been so fun to dive into uh, optimal holistic uh, health for mood disorders, anxiety, depression. Um, and if you like this episode, be sure and hit like, hit subscribe so you can stay tuned to future episodes. Thank you again, Dr. Bongiorno, for, for joining oh, us today. My honor. Thank you. And thank you for all the amazing work you do and, and bringing good information to so many people. It helps so many.